Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to welcome all of you here on behalf of the SPS and the ANA. The agency is the original and only diplomatic news consultancy in India. It has been providing expert editorial services to the India-based diplomatic community for close to 40 years. One of its main services is provided by the weekly journal News Behind the News. The latest copy is in all your folders in front of you. NBN, as it is referred to in diplomatic circles, is a journal designed and structured exclusively for the diplomatic community in India. It provides news and analysis of major events and developments week after week. It provides the readers an insight and understanding into the complex of India's polity, security, foreign policy, and economy. The journal is subscribed to by almost the entire diplomatic community. To know more about Asia News Agency and its services, please visit our website, www.nbnindia.com. Now I'd like to welcome our respected guests and participants. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Your Excellencies, Ambassador of Turkmenistan, Mr. Parakhat Homadvoik Dordve. I'm sorry, please excuse if my pronunciation isn't perfect. Uh, Ambassador of Kazakhstan, Mr. Dolat uh, Kwanis Chef. Ambassador of Morocco, Mr. Larbi Refu. And Ambassador of Bolivia, Mr. Jorge Cardenas Robel. I would also I would also like to welcome Mr. Ajay Bissaria, Joint Secretary Eurasia. Ministry of External Affairs, Mr. D. V. Singh, former Secretary, Ministry of Water Resources, Mr. Ashok Sajinhar, former Ambassador to Kazakhstan, Mr. Rajiv Dogra, former Ambassador to Italy, and Christina Albertine, Representative UNODC. A special welcome to our keynote speakers today, Mr. William Young, Lead Resource South Asia Water Initiative, World Bank. Mr. Brahma uh, Chalani. Chalani. I'm so sorry about that. Mr. Brahma Chalani, Professor of Strategic Studies at the Center for Policy Research and Water Research Ex uh, Resources Expert. Mr. Uttam Kumar Sinha, IDSA. Mr. Sanjoy Hazarika, Director, Center for Northeast Studies, Jamia. And Mr. Joydeep Gupta, Third Pole, UK. Welcome to all diplomats from participating countries. I thank you all once again for joining us today to discuss such an important topic of our time, water security. Special thanks to the Society for Policy Studies, which have helped to bring this roundtable together. I now hand you over to Commodore Uday Bhaskar for taking the roundtable forward. Thank you, Rashi. And since a very detailed welcome has already been extended, I will uh, skip that part and move straight into the session, largely because we have, as most of you would have noticed, a very rich panel of speakers, and we are under a slight time constraint, which is why I took the liberty of requesting our distinguished panelists and speakers to stay within the time limits that we have set for ourselves. A quick sort of uh, word about my own locus here. I am with the Society for Policy Studies, and Tarun has very, I think, uh, prudently or intelligently said that, why don't you be the timekeeper? So I have that slightly unenviable task, and you'll bear with me, all my panelists and speakers. Uh, we already have one slight change in our program, which is that Professor Brahma Chalani has just sent us a message to say that he is detained due to bad traffic, but he is uh, listed to give the <coughs> keynote address, which he will as soon as he joins. But I've made a slight tweak to the program. And I'll request Rajiv Dogra, our former ambassador, Ambassador Dogra, to Italy, who has been working on these issues for a long time to be the first speaker and kick off. Just a very quick word before we do that is that to place this whole issue in context, we are very glad to have with us Ambassador Ashok Sajanhar, who is the former Indian ambassador to Kazakhstan and has spent many years both here in headquarters and in <coughs> postings abroad looking at some of these issues. So without any further ado, I'll request uh, Ambassador Sajanhar, who incidentally now is the chairman of the Interfaith, uh, the National Interfaith uh, Dialogue Committee that we have here in Delhi. 
Ambassador Sajanar, all yours. Thank you very much, uh, for uh, uh, your opening comments. Let me also add my voice of uh, gratitude, appreciation, and uh, commendation to SPS and to ANA for uh, putting together this uh, panel, this seminar for this uh, on this very important subject. Now, in my intro opening remarks, as has been mentioned here, let me uh, identify just a few critical areas or issues as far as the uh, river water uh, disputes, riverine disputes in Central Asia are concerned. Or let us say, what uh, uh, is the issue of uh, sharing of water in uh, Central Asia? I will. Uh, possibly in the 10 minutes or so that has been allotted to me at this moment. Focus on some of the aspects that have been at the forefront of discussions and <coughs> deliberations over the last 20, 30, 40 years. I think the first aspect that I would like to bring to your attention is the what has been uh, termed as the worst uh, environmental disaster in human history, and that is the condition and fate of the Aral Sea. And from that, maybe I will sort of, you know, come over and draw into some of the other issues and problems that confront us. Now, Aral Sea, I think, as most of us who are participating in this seminar would know, is uh, situated in the southwest of uh, Kazakhstan. It is fed by two rivers, two major rivers, two important rivers, the Amu Darya and the Sir Darya. Amu Darya is the southern river which uh, originates from the uh, Pamir Mountains, the Pamir Plateau, on the border between uh, Tajikistan and Afghanistan. <coughs> it uh, originates from there and finds its way through Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, meandering its way, getting in and out of the two countries. And finally, it finds its way into the Aral Sea, or it used to find its way into the Aral Sea. It is a river that is about 2,400 kilometers long and it has a very uh, significant water discharge and water flows. The other river is the Sir Darya which uh, originates from the Tian Shan mountains from Kyrgyzstan and from there it comes to Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and gets into Kazakhstan. The problem as far as the environmental disaster that I referred to in the Aral Sea is concerned really commenced in the 1960s when it was decided by the Soviet Union that to get away from their dependence on imports of cotton from uh, uh, Britain and from the United States, they needed to use the uh, area in Uzbekistan and possibly in the south of Kazakhstan for growing cotton. As a result, uh, Amu Darya, Sir Darya, both these rivers, particularly Amu Darya, was, uh, uh, was uh, so, uh, <coughs> there was a very complex system of canals, of irrigation channels, of uh, 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 dams and dikes which was constructed, as a result of which much of the river that was coming in the Amu Darya into the, uh, from the Amu Darya into the Aral Sea, that was taken for irrigation principally into Uzbekistan, which means that uh, from 1960 till about 1980, the condition of the Aral Sea became from one that was a living habitat for the fish, for the uh, marine uh, uh, resources, it became a dry, it became a dry uh, area. It was completely desiccated, it was completely dehydrated. So much so that uh, the expanse of the sea was reduced to 10% of what it was. Just to give you maybe a few uh, figures in this context, the salinity levels, which used to be about 10 grams per liter, increased to about 100 grams per liter by the end. In the 1960s, it was about 10 grams. <coughs> the level of water came down by about 23 meters. And uh, the Aral Sea, which had existed as a single sea with uh, a large number of islands which were dotting the sea, it was broken up into 
three or four smaller patches of water which meant that uh, there was because of the high salinity levels there was no fishing uh, that was possible there was no uh, navigation that was possible all the uh, there were dust storms there were salt storms in the city uh, in the in the area there was a uh, very significant impact on climate change and on the environment uh, while uh, I stop talking about uh, Aral Sea and come to the two rivers that uh, have been feeding this uh, this uh, uh, sea. This is the this used to be the fourth largest uh, mass of water in the world, inland lake in the world. But now it has been. Uh, it was by the end of uh, 1980s and 1990s. It was completely destroyed. So much so that, uh, mm, uh, of course, in the beginning of the 21st century in 2005, the government of Kazakhstan and the World Bank, they got together to build a dam uh, on the Sir Darya, as a result of which the level of water has been rising by 2010-11, the level of water had risen to uh, by about 9-10 meters. As I had mentioned, it had gone down by about 23 meters. But it is a debatable point, it is a moot point whether the Aral Sea will again be able to get back to its former glory. <coughs> now if we, come, if we look at the uh, two big rivers that I have mentioned, the Amudarya and the Sirdarya. The Amudarya, it uh, goes, as I said, Afghanistan it, uh, uh, from the Pamir uh, mountains. But Afghanistan has not been a part of these discussions so far. Of course, of late, there have been some moves to in, involve Afghanistan also. And as uh, hopefully peace returns to Afghanistan, that will also become a very important player. Now, let me mention the, uh, I think the ba biggest issue as far as river waters in Central Asia is concerned is not of quantity. There are adequate quantities in the rivers that are uh, the river water that is available. It is really of distribution. Problem is of distribution, problem is of water <coughs> management. Earlier during the Soviet times what used to happen is, now as I mentioned, Tajikistan it holds the, that is the upper riparian for the, uh, for the, uh, for Amudarya. And Kyrgyzstan is the upper riparian for Sirdarya. They are the two countries which provide the maximum amount of water flow into these two rivers. However, if you look at the water allocation that uh, was decided upon after the 1960s when uh, cotton plantation was started in uh, uh, Uzbekistan and in uh, uh, Turkmenistan, then we saw that about 56% of the water was used by Uzbekistan. There was about 82% of the water that was used by the lower riparian rivers. About 56 by Uzbekistan, 17% by Turkmenistan, 10% by Kazakhstan. And the rest, 17-18% water was used by the upper riparians from where the rivers actually started, which is uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, but uh, as we can see, at that time what used to happen is that cheap coal, oil and gas used to come to these two countries or rather to these uh, former Soviet Union uh, republics for meeting their energy needs. So the water used to be supplied during winter months to these lower riparian states while their own energy needs were met through import of cheap uh, or supply of uh, cheap oil, coal and gas. However, after 1991, when all these countries became independent, this was no longer possible. As a result, what Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan want to do is use this water for energy generation, for hydropower generation during winter months, and store that water during summer, which means that it is not really available to the lower Iberian states, particularly Uzbekistan. So uh, the basic interest of Tajikistan, I'll go very quickly over the five states in the two or three minutes that I have available with me. It's become one now. It's become one? Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will stretch it to one and a half. Yeah. 
Tajikistan hydropower and a little bit of irrigation. Kyrgyzstan hydropower and decent amount of irrigation. Uzbekistan irrigation for cotton it has become self-sufficient in food, wheat etc. But lot of water required for irrigation. Kazakhstan basically for uh, the uh, ecological uh, preservation because Amu Darya has stopped being coming even to the Aral Sea and Turkmenistan basically for irrigation purposes. So these are the conflicting, uh, uh, conflicting positions. Russia is active because it has been helping Kazakhstan and uh, Tajikistan in some way to harness the water resources there. Before I end, let me also very quickly mention that there are two other rivers, transboundary rivers, which we need to keep in mind. And those two rivers are, which are shared between Kazakhstan and China. One is the river Ili, which comes from China and goes to Lake Balkash. The other is river Irtish or Kara Irtish, Black Irtish, which comes from China, goes through, through Kazakhstan and on to Russia meeting with the river Ob, which goes into the Arctic Ocean. <coughs> now here also there have been discussions between Kazakhstan and uh, China. There have been uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, dialogue, but uh, it does not appear that uh, there has been any forward movement that has been made. China has said that it is within its authority to use 40% of the water in Irtish for its own use because of the demographic move of the Han population. As far as Ili is concerned, Balkhash has al already started seeing its levels go down. So there are all these issues. The issues are sensitive, the issues are controversial, and the issues are contentious. I leave it there. Thank you, Ambassador Sajanhar, and my earnest apologies. You know, you are in full flow, and we can see your depth of knowledge on the subject. But this is one of the constraints of my current uh, timekeeping job. Before I request Ambassador Dogra, allow me to recognize uh, Mr. Ajay Besaria, our Joint Secretary for Eurasia, who has just joined us, as also Our Excellencies, the Ambassador of Morocco, and other dignitaries who have joined us in the last few minutes. On that note, I will request Ambassador Rajiv Dogra, to maybe make his remarks. He will be talking to us about water security issues in Central Asia. And I think Ashok Sabak said you well into what you might want to say. Sir, all yours. Now, I feel very hesitant talking about water security in Central Asia for one simple reason, that there is His Excellency, the Ambassador of Kazakhstan, who can teach me a lot about water in Central Asia. Uh, you've just heard Ambassador Sajandhar, and of course, there's brilliant Ajay, who's doing remarkable work for promoting Indo-Central Asian relations. So uh, I, I wish I had spoken at the end and just nodded my head at <coughs> whatever you had said. So, uh, but since I was asked to speak, for once I did some research on the computer. <laughs> and what I was amazed at was that whether you type in the word Central Asia water or Central Asia water security, you get a huge number of whatever these young people call it, uh, information coming back to you. And each one of them talks in terms of Central Asia water conflict, Central Asia water war. I was really surprised whether we are talking of Central Asia or some other part of Asia. Because the Central Asia I had seen, and I hope Ajay beats my record, I think during my time I was the most widely traveled diplomat in and over Central Asia, anywhere in the world. Uh, and my greatest delight was whether you flew into Tajikistan or any other part of Central Asia, was the absolutely clear, blue, pristine waters. And I thought this area is never, never going to be starved of water and never going to have a water security issue. In fact, we were hoping <coughs> that Central Asia would become the granary of Asia. It would supply agricultural and horticultural products all over Asia because it had so much water. So as I said, the computer educated me a little bit 
And let me share the result of my new knowledge. The five Central Asian states, computer told me, has an area of 4 million square kilometers, which is slightly larger than India. And in this larger than India space, only 60 million people live. So how can such a sparsely populated area have a water problem or a water security problem? And as, I, as Ashok just mentioned, uh, there's Amudarya, which has uh, a water uh, capacity of 75 cubic kilo kilometers, which is about 62% of the region's water resources. And the second, Sirdarya, has a capacity of 36 cubic kilometers. Now, just to give you a comparison, we in India have the Indus Water River System. We in India, or rather India, and Pakistan. The portion given to <coughs> India is three rivers called Satluj, Ravi, and Vyas. And the water availability in these three rivers is only 11.1 .1 cubic kilometers. So compare this to what is available in the second biggest river in Central Asia, which is Sirdarya, which has three times more water availability than three rivers which feed probably 70, 150 or more million people in northern India. So once again, I ask myself, how is it that Central Asia is now facing a situation of conflict and even more as per the computer? Now, Central Asia is not a region which was water underdeveloped at any stage. 3,500 years ago, it had a beautiful hydraulic system. <coughs> and this was supplemented by Mughals and their lava fountains, but more recently by the Soviets in 1960s. The Soviets, in fact, devised a system of water distribution within the five states, which continues to govern the water distribution even today in Central Asia. But that unfortunately worked to the misunderstandings or lack of understandings between the Central Asian states today. Because the Soviet system was based on regional sharing. Whereas today, the upper riparians like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are talking in terms of national resources. In fact, the other thing one should remember is that like China, some of the Central Asian states, I won't name them, but some of the Central Asian states treat waters originating in their territory as their sovereign right. India does not do that. China does it, and some of the Central Asian states do it. The other problem which uh, Ambassador Sajanar uh, referred to was the utilization of waters. For example, Tajikistan wants waters to be released from its dams in winters because it needs that water for electricity generation in winters for heating purposes. But Uzbekistan wants them to be released in summers because it needs those waters in summers for cotton cultivation. So there are these small kind of uh, issues which can lead to misunderstandings sometime or the other. But there is also a system of consultations, both at the technical level and ministerial level, which works. So I am not so apprehensive about a war breaking out tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But what I am worried about is the fact that despite these consultations, the political will seems to be not there in adequate measure. And second, there is an omission. Afghanistan shares the Amudarya. But Afghanistan is not part of any consultation between Central Asian states and it even though 25% of Afghanistan's population is dependent on waters from Amu Darya. So that is another issue that Central Asian states would have to think of uh, <coughs> as they go forward in future. So like the waters in Central Asian states, I've been told that your resources are very limited, and I'll stop right here. Uh, what I will do now is 
because of, as I said, a certain uh, rearrangement in the program, Mr. Bisaria, Joint Secretary Eurasia, uh, he has to leave a little early. I think all the diplomats in this room would know that all our Joint Secretaries in the MEA have multiple sort of tasking that they have to do. Given the current situation in that part of the world, I don't know what's the latest in Ukraine. I'm presuming that you have to deal with that amongst other issues. I'll request Mr. Bisaria to make his remarks and perhaps he will be able to join us for a little bit of the session. And again, just as a matter of uh, detail, it's there in your program. He's currently JS Eurasia. He has 11 countries and various other issues served in the region. Ajay, all yours. I, I would have preferred to have listened to uh, some of the experts before I spoke, um, but uh, uh, since you've given me the floor, let me very briefly uh, just make a few remarks about water. Um, I had the privilege of uh, uh, working as an advisor at the World Bank um, for four years, and uh, I'm aware of the reputation of Bill Young as an expert on, on water. Um, in, in, in fact, one of the uh, first uh, assignments I had was to deal with the Indus Water Treaty when uh, it became an uh, issue when uh, uh, Pakistan uh, raised the issue of the Baglihar Dam and we dealt with this uh, uh, at great length. Uh, but uh, coming to Central Asia, I think uh, I'll confine myself, Ambassador Sajjanar and uh, Ambassador Dogra have already spoken about uh, uh, the uh, uh, the implications of water and, and the water politics of the region. But uh, let me say that uh, we do recognize that water is an extremely important and a very uh, contested and contentious <coughs> issue in the region. And uh, therefore, uh, consciously, India is, uh, is not part of uh, the uh, water politics or the water discourse in Central Asia. Uh, we, uh, as part of our Connect Central pa Asia policy, water uh, uh, issues are not, uh, not a center stage in our discussions. But having said that, we, uh, we do, as part of our water policy, as part of our Central Asia policy, uh, have discussions with uh, our Central Asian partners on water issues, primarily uh, as a, uh, in order to share experiences. Uh, we have, for instance, with Kazakhstan said that we are willing uh, and uh, we have agreed to share experiences on uh, water management issues with our neighbors. We have also uh, similarly had uh, discussions with uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan. In Tajikistan, uh, we have uh, worked uh, on uprating uh, what we call the Varzob uh, project, a 9.5 megawatt uh, mini hydro station, and we continue to be in discussion about uh, setting up mini hydro stations, uh, which we feel uh, can be uh, uh, part of the uh, the water management as well as the power management situation. But um, I, on the table, I just wanted to put one idea uh, f as as an issue that can be used for crowdsourcing, uh, and that is the issue of uh, Casa One Thousand. This issue comes up repeatedly, and uh, uh, I have on earlier occasions asked our experts whether India is considered part of this game. Because I've had two different versions about it. One is that uh, there is no way, technical way in which the surplus electricity can be brought in all the way to India. But I was told recently by an expert that there is a possibility, and uh, if, if there is a grid extending all the way uh, from Central Asia to South Asia, India can be part of it and India can uh, benefit from <coughs> the electricity that is coming in. We are already talking of uh, uh, energy resources in terms of tapi uh, and gas coming all the way from Central Asia to India. So the paradigm of a, uh, an, a corridor, an economic corridor ex already exists. So I just wanted to put this idea on the table for any experts who would know uh, more than I do, whether it is a technically feasible proposition for India to be part of CASA 1000. Let me stop right there. Thank you very much, Ajay. I think that provides, I think, a uh, few very important strands that could be taken up. Now, allow me to invite Mr. William Young. He's already been introduced as someone who has a certain profile about water. And he has also been referred to as Abu Ben Adam. I gather when it comes to water issues in the World Bank. So, Mr. Young, all yours. Yeah, I have prepared some slides to talk Please. to you today. Um, 
can I go no, over there to control them? Please, please. And then I will es escape from the very delicious time. No, but time I shall still catch your eye if you allow me to. Oh, Brahma has also joined us. Please come, Brahma. But go ahead, please. And the, the light on the projection is not so strong, so we may struggle a little bit. We will try and get the lights off, I think. Are okay. you with me? Your time will start when your slides start showing. How's that? That's okay. a fair deal. Yeah, that's <laughs> a fair deal to me. So good afternoon, Hi, everybody. Ramah. My name is uh, Bill Young. I'm based here in New Delhi with the World Bank as a lead water resources specialist. Um, I come from a research background and leading the... So hit your mic, that one. Yeah, just hit that sure. mic. Yeah. Been leading the water yeah. research efforts uh, in, the Austra in Australia for the Australian government for the last uh, number of years. <laughs> uh, and a lot of what we've been doing in that part of the world, technically, I think, can have, uh, add value to this part of the world, which is part of the reason I'm here. So what I wanted to talk about today, we are shifting gears. Most of the conversation so far has been focused on Central Asia, which is an area which I know far less well. I have had some experience in working in the World Bank in that part of the world on irrigation rehabilitation. Um, but I want to talk more about Central Asia, um, particularly coming from the perspective uh, of the South Asia Water Initiative, which I lead uh, within the bank. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, as we progress. Uh, first of all, I should say here, it's a little <coughs> hard to see, but this is a satellite view of the Himalaya, uh, the Himalaya, Himalaya Hindu Kush mountain ranges, which um, define, I guess, so much of the regional uh, South Asia, both water resources, geopolitics and everything, and, and are clearly a, a feature that you can see from space. Uh, in, again, the colours here you can't really see on the projector, I'm afraid, um, but I can leave and distribute a copy of these slides for later. But South Asia, at, at least much of it, is what is, has been characterised as being economically, uh, an economic area of economic water scarcity. There's plenty of water physically, but economically in terms of the institutions, the financial and human capa uh, <coughs> capital to develop those and use those, it's seen as economically scarce. As you move further up to the northwest into the Indus Basin, the more semi-arid region, uh, there, is, there are areas of physical water scarcity. Um, so, interesting, the comments made by Rajiv Dogra, th there is a difference, uh, certainly, in the nature of scarcity between these two regions. I was taken with the figures on the areas and the population. If you compare that to the Ganges, with over 600 million people and a million square kilometres, you have a population density there of 40 times as much as what was described for Central Asia. So huge pressures uh, on the water resources of South Asia. Also, of course, for the future, a real hot spot in terms of uh, multiple impacts of climate change. Again, a little hard to see here, but there will be issues in this part of the world in climate change in terms of increased flooding, in terms of uh, impacts on uh, degradation of freshwater resources, on impacts on food production systems, and environmentally induced uh, migration. A few of the other challenges <coughs> of this part of the world, at the top, the typical monsoon pattern of availability of water. Hugely strong <coughs> pattern between the wet, the monsoon season <coughs> and the time in which we need uh, water for agriculture, which means that storage is an important part of the system to, uh, to buffer out those variability. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that while there is a, this is, I guess I'll get to the storage question on the next slide, <coughs> but you can see, for example, between, say, Asia and Europe, we've got about the same amount of uh, water per capita, so we're actually not, it's not too bad. But there's, it's just this great dichotomy between the amount of water and the number of people that makes it a, a big challenge. In terms of storage, very low levels of storage in terms of dams and reservoirs in this part of the, the world, and significant technical as well as geopolitical yeah. challenges in constructing more storages in the headwaters of the systems. Uh, in terms of hydropower, which is the bottom one showing, and it's very hard to see there, but you can see that only a fraction of the economically feasible hydropower has been developed in this part of the world. The uh, hydropower potential of Nepal alone is worth the order of $10 billion a year in, in, in electricity on at current prices. Uh, but arriving at uh, <coughs> trade and power sharing deals between Nepal and its neighbours is a, an important part of the problem, or the challenge. Uh, the other thing to note, of course, is in South Asia, and in, in, in the Ganges in particular, but uh, I think the Indus as well, the Brahmaputra a little different, 90% of the water that is used is used for irrigation. So that is the big footprint in terms of the demand on the water resource. And these, these numbers show, a little hard to see, that the proportional uh, representation of agriculture and irrigation in GDP has been 
dropping rapidly over recent decades. So water continues to use a lot of the, the large part of the resource, but it's contributing less and less in a, in a proportional way as industry and other parts of the economy grow. So there is an increasing challenge, given that w water is largely fully committed, to move that water out of agriculture into industry, into the cities for water supplies, and yet continue to produce more food for a growing population. If you look at some of the, the, the softer side of things, uh, in many parts of South Asia, the, the legal and regulatory frameworks for managing water in, are inadequate. That's just at a national level, not even between countries. Many of the water institutions need strengthening to be able to improve water management. There's a very top-down approach to much of this and not enough engagement bottom-up from water users. There are no multilateral basin management mechanisms. There are some bilateral arrangements which have been working moderately well, uh, but they all have their, that's, many of them are narrow and not comprehensive. And there are many vested interests and uh, various policy distortions, some of which have been widely discussed in terms of power subsidies and what that means in the agricultural sector for water use. The bottom graph just is a, a, a global view in terms of the number of transboundary agreements around water that have been signed uh, internationally over the last few decades. And you can see that that is a sharp decline. Uh, as things become more, more conflict and more difficult, people are less able to negotiate and agree on transboundary arrangements. Um, a few things around from an India point of view, 90% of India is drained by interstate rivers, so transboundary issues are a big, a big domestic challenge for India. Um, and over one third of the, the water resources of the, the country is in international rivers. Uh, there is a lack of clear implemented interstate allocation rules and this is leading to ongoing disputes between the states within the country as water resources are increasingly developed. There are some international uh, transboundary agreements and uh, most of those, uh, or a number of those on, uh, for different parts of the Ganges Basin as well as the Indus Water Treaty that has been mentioned. The Indus Water Treaty of course is not really, a, it's not a basin uh, mechanism, it's more a partitioning rather than a sharing uh, approach. It's been appropriate to this, uh, the context there. And all the other treaties have had various iterations and been part of ongoing political negotiations. Uh, this is a, a, an image I like because it, sh it shows to me perhaps some of the lack of regional integration. It's a satellite image of the uh, lights uh, across the, the Indo-Gangetic Plain leading up into the Himalaya into Nepal. Uh, and shows that distinct boundary which reflects issues of economic development, infrastructure and, and growth. Um, but that strong partitioning, and you can see that in the trade numbers here, South Asia, uh, in terms of uh, in, intra-regional trade, trade within the region is the least integrated of any region in, in, in the world. Um, and very different, interestingly, between Europe and Central Asia, where there is a lot of trade between countries. And so this is, uh, sort of undermines, I guess, regional economic development in many ways. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about South Asia Water Initiative. Uh, this has, this is, um, has been going, going since uh, 2009, but we've begun a new phase uh, in the last year or so with um, money donated from the governments of the United Kingdom, Australia and Norway. <coughs> it has an objective to increase regional cooperation in the management of the major Himalayan river systems of South Asia to deliver sustainable, fair and inclusive development and climate resilience. How are we going about this? is by seeking to catalyse reforms and investments in water infrastructure <laughs> through three modalities, if you like. Filling key knowledge gaps, raising awareness and building capacity, and acting as a neutral broker of dialogue and uh, negotiations, particularly attracting to dialogue. I'll skip that. Our, our key principles, I guess, are we are focused on water resources management, even though that is not sort of, uh, in headlines in the objective. We're very much focused on the regional cooperation, the transboundary elements at a river basin scale. We seek to be inclusive <coughs> and multidisciplinary, and we seek to be participatory and deliberative. So those are our sort of our main, you know, how we guide what we engage in. Uh, we are structured around the three major river basins of the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, as well as a focus on the Sundarbans landscape at the bottom of the Ganges Brahmaputra system. We have a fifth theme on cross-cutting dialogue and cooperation where things which are not basin specific um, are managed from. So I you have two more minutes. Two more minutes, perfect, thank you Chair. I want to say a little bit about the Abu Dhabi Abu Dhabi dialogue because some of you I expect are familiar with that. It began in 2006 at this first international conference for South Asian water cooperation and SAWI in fact emerged out of that when that uh, group of dialogue uh, 
decided it would be helpful for it to have a work program to support its, um, its engagements. Uh, and so donors supported that from 2009. We are now moving with ADD to uh, a stronger focus on the specific basins and forming basin forums or discussion groups. Uh, that's begun in the end with a couple of meetings, one in Kabul last year and a study tour in the last month or so through to Ecuador to look at cooperative approaches to glacier monitoring. We're beginning to uh, establish dialogue mechanisms for the Ganges and Brahmaputra basins as well. Uh, challenge or confront some of the long-held opinions and we are keen to use it to engage more fulsomely on dialogue around these issues with key stakeholders. Um, I might leave that one up, Chair, just because there's, what I see is some of the key challenges and opportunities for SAWI around, perhaps that second was in, is important, identifying and demonstrating win-win opportunities in transboundary basin management. I think it's easy to assume that cooperative uh, approaches always lead to a win-win outcome. I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think there's a key job there for people involved in analytical work to show uh, and reveal what those win-win opportunities actually are. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. A brief word. We've already circulated uh, Professor Chalari's CV to you. But as most of you would be aware, he has made a very, very distinctive contribution to our understanding of water issues. He has now published two books on the subject, amongst his many other sort of writings. And this is a book that was released by the Honorable Vice President just a few days ago. Brahma, on that note, can I request you to please make your remarks? Oh, well, thank you. Um, let me begin by congratulating uh, Uday and his team for organizing this important seminar. Central Asia and South Asia share not only history and culture, but they also share common water security concerns. In fact, uh, water is emerging as a key issue, not just in Central Asia and South Asia, but Asia as a whole. If you look at Asia as a continent, it is a pretty water-stressed continent. Its water resources in per capita terms are not even one-tenth that of South America. They're less than one-fourth of North America, barely one-third of Europe, and 25% less than Africa. Many people think of Africa as being the driest continent, Actually, it's Asia, which is the driest continent, uh, in fact, the fastest growing continent in the world. Uh, Asia's water crisis actually raises the issue whether Asia can continue to be the global economic locomotive without finding ways to mitigate its water crisis. Another feature about Asia is that much of uh, the water on this continent is a shared resource. Dependence on cross-border water inflows is high. This makes interstate cooperation essential. Only one country is happily placed in Asia. I, I can, you know, I can imagine you can guess that country. Uh, it's China. Uh, China's dependency on cross-border water inflows is one of the lowest in the world, less than one percent. And this happened not because of geography, but because of guns. Its annexation of the Tibetan Plateau and Xinjiang changed the water map of Asia. The Tibet Plateau, as you know, is the source of the major rivers of Asia, while Xinjiang is the source of two rivers that flow into Kazakhstan, the Ili and the Itush rivers. So in one stroke, the water map of Asia changed after the communists uh, came to power in China. Coming specifically to Central Asia, and um, South Asia, these are two regions that share water insecurity concerns. And water insecurity uh, is a growing issue in both these sub-regions. In terms of land area, it's interesting to note that both Central Asia and South Asia, as defined in Western literature, because these are artificial constructs, but you know, just, just, going, just going by the US State Department definition of what South Asia is, uh, which is the Indian subcontinent, and Central Asia being the five stands of uh, the region, the land area size is about the same. But the water resources and the population density are so very different. For example, South Asia has 18 times the population of Central Asia in the same land area size. In global terms, Central Asia has 0.6% of the world's internally renewable water resources, while South Asia has 4.1%. So 
So in per capita terms, South Asia is a far more water-stressed region than Central Asia. But that doesn't detract from the fact that Central Asia is increasingly a thirsty region. Another factor common to both these sub-regions is the fact that uh, there are water sharing arrangements in place in both these sub-regions. There are 57 transnational river basins in Asia, but the vast majority of them have no water sharing or any cooperative institutionalized mechanism in place. And the only two sub-regions of Asia where we have water sharing arrangements in place are South Asia and Central Asia. The difference is that in Central Asia, the water sharing arrangements are informal in nature, while in South Asia, they are formal treaty-based arrangements. Because when the Central Asian states became independent in 1991, in one stroke, the internal rivers became international rivers. This created a serious interstate issue for the Central Asian states, how to deal with the new reality. And on an informal basis, the Soviet era water arrangements <coughs> continue in place in Central Asia, though they have been supplemented by side agreements, for example, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan signed an agreement in 1996 to supplement the Five Nation Interim Accord of February 1992. In contrast, the treaty arrangements in uh, South Asia are unique. In fact, the only water sharing treaties in Asia with specific sharing formulas are the ones that India has signed with its two downstream neighbors. Pakistan and Bangladesh. Each of them sets a new principle in international water law. The one with Bangladesh uh, has a new principle of specified minimum commitment in the dry season. It's roughly a 50-50 sharing of downstream flows in the dry season, which is from March to May and other parts of the year. Again, specific allocations have been specified, while the Indus Waters Treaty between India and Pakistan is a colossus on the world stage. If you look at all the water sharing treaties that we have in the world, there are not too many of them, they're less than two dozen. The Indus Water Treaty stands out for its generosity to the downstream partner, both in terms of the sharing ratio, which is more than 80% reserved for downstream state Pakistan, but also in the total quantum of waters reserved for Pakistan. It's more than 167 billion, not million, billion cubic meters of water per year. Uh, there's no other treaty in the world which comes anyway close to this level of water munificence. To give you a comparative picture, Mexico's share under the joint uh, water <coughs> treaty with the United States is less than one ninetieth of Pakistan's share under the Indus Treaty. So you have formal and informal uh, water sharing arrangements in place uh, in, in this part of the world, that is in Central Asia and in uh, South Asia. But such is a struggle for water that even water sharing arrangements are not free of rancor and discord. Whether these are informal or formal arrangements, we see differences and discord erupting periodically. We had more recently the case where Pakistan took India's Baglihar, sorry, the Kishan Ganga. Uh, first was the Baglihar project, which was uh, sent to an international neutral expert, and more recently, the Kishan Ganga project was, uh, was um, uh, taken to an international court of arbitration. A third point, which is actually, in a way, makes Central Asia and South Asia dissimilar to each other, the water flows in South Asia, transboundary water flows, they flow from the <coughs> big countries to the smaller countries. The reverse is true of Central Asia. You have the two small <coughs> countries of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which are the, which are the headwaters of the Sardarya and the Amudarya rivers. While in South Asia, much of the regional water resources are generated either in Tibet or in India, and then they flow, these waters flow downstream to countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. There are two caveats here. First, there's, there's some water which flows from Nepal to India, though 
uh, even though that flow is important for India's northern plains, this flow is relatively modest when you look at the bigger picture. The real exception is Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan gets about 10 billion cubic meters of water yearly from the Sir Darya River, but it gets actually a much greater flow from Chinese Hill Territory, from Xinjiang. The Ili River and the Irtush River together are the source of more than 21 billion cubic meters of water for Kazakhstan from Chinese territory. A fourth point uh, is, that, um, is that China uh, has emerged as an issue of common concern uh, to South Asia and to Central Asia. Uh, when I talk about Central Asia there, I principally am referring to Kazakhstan because Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan don't really have a water relationship with, um, with China. It's Kazakhstan and to a much smaller extent, Kyrgyzstan. But in South Asia, uh, China is a very important factor because whether you are Bangladesh or you, you are Pakistan, even if you're not getting water directly from China, the fact is that China is, through its control of Tibet, is, um, is a key player, especially because of its new dam building program. And what we are seeing now uh, in terms of uh, the Chinese damming activity is a very unique feature. We don't see that anywhere else in the world. Here is a country that is building cascades of dams right on its borders to divert river waters just before they flow out of its territory. Shared water is a source of competition across the world. So we are used to countries wanting a greater share of a transboundary water course. But we don't see this kind of a pattern where a country is building <laughs> cascades of dams right on the border. If, we, if you see the Mekong upstream dams that China has built, these, be, these have been built just before the Mekong leaves Chinese territory. The new dams coming up on the Salving follow a similar pattern. If you look at the Chinese maps uh, of approved dams, on the Arun River, which is an important river for Nepal and becomes the Kosi River in India, five dams have been approved for construction right on the border uh, of Tibet and Nepal. And, and therefore, this, this makes uh, China a, an issue of concern, especially for Kazakhstan, because uh, the Ili River is uh, an important river that feeds late Lake Balkash. Lake Balkash <coughs> now faces a specter of becoming another Aral Sea. The Aral Sea has been an environmental disaster <coughs> because its two sources of water, the Sir Darya and the Amud Darya, now deliver only a trickle into the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea has shrunk to, to barely one quarter of its original size. And now because of the diversion of the upstream waters of the Ili River, Lake Balkash faces the threat of becoming another Aral Sea. Similarly, if you look at the Irtush River, which flows into Kazakhstan and then flows on to Western Siberia, where it merges with Russia's Ob River, the diversion of upstream waters by China by building a canal to feed its booming oil town of Karamai is threatening the water security of Western Siberia. So, what we are seeing is that a number of countries that neighbor China and Central Asia, including Russia, <coughs> as well as the countries of South Asia, have a, have a common concern about China. The fifth point is on the role of agricultural exports in exacerbating water stress, both in Central Asia and in South Asia. And in doing so, this factor underscores the need to restructure some local economies. The cotton curse in Central Asia has been the main factor in the degradation of water and land resources. It's also the main factor in the environmental catastrophe that the Aral Sea represents. It's the diversion of the waters of these rivers for cotton monoculture that has created this kind of huge environmental crisis in Central Asia. Even today, countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan 
rely on cotton exports as a major source of foreign exchange earnings. Then you have a country like Pakistan, which diverts 94% of its water for food and other agricultural products. In the case of Pakistan, <laughs> agricultural exports are its lifeline. They are the main source of foreign exchange earnings. And this reliance on exporting water-rich agricultural products has seriously aggravated Pakistan's water crisis. Pakistan is the world's third largest exporter of rice and the world's fourth biggest producer of cotton. The two most water intensive of all agricultural products are rice and cotton. So you have a case here where Pakistan is exporting rice to water <coughs> surplus European Union and exporting cotton to the United States. In other words, by exporting rice and cotton, Pakistan in effect is exporting water, water in a virtual form. And the only way we can actually deal with this water crisis in Pakistan or within Uzbekistan is by restructuring the local economy so that they rely less on agricultural exports. It's a big task, but, but this is something that uh, the water crisis is making imperative. The sixth point is about how in this increasing struggle for water, water-rich areas are becoming the source of geopolitical tensions. What is common between Tibet, Central Asia's Fergana Valley, and Kashmir? It is water. The fact that these particular areas are water rich and therefore they become a magnet for geopolitical competition. So let me conclude by raising the question that given the struggle for water that we're seeing in both Central Asia and in South Asia, how do we prevent this struggle from becoming a tipping point for conflict, overt conflict? The short answer is by investing in institutionalized cooperation. There is no other mechanism other than to cooperate with each other on transnational <laughs> water resources. Transparency, collaboration, and sharing are the building blocks of water peace. These subregions also need new market mechanisms, public private partnerships, innovative practices and technologies conservation, smart water management, and increasing resort to unconventional methods of water management and sourcing supply. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chalani. I think that was a very comprehensive and lucid overview. In many ways, a curtain raiser to his book. Having had occasion to see it, I would urge all of you to read that book. I think it has a lot to offer. Brahma's made two, three very irrelevant points. You know, one is, I think, about the current pattern that we have as far as water sharing is concerned. And he has drawn specific attention to the Indian model, as it were, which has equity, a very equitable arrangement of sharing as the basic foundation and the practice in relation to other parts of Asia, particularly China. And I think he's also drawn very, very important attention to cotton and rice and what it means for large parts of Asia. And I think this, again, gives us a very appropriate introduction to the ambassador of Kazakhstan, who I think, as the largest state there, will give us the Kazakh view on the subject. But before I welcome the Excellency, the ambassador of Kazakhstan, allow me to introduce and welcome the ambassador from Turkmenistan also, who has joined us. He will follow. His remarks will follow that of our Kazakh ambassador. Sir, all yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Professor, for giving me or uh, after such a very interesting presentations and uh, I would like to start with uh, our acknowledgements. I think that Ambassador Sajan Khar and Ambassador Dogra uh, spoke very well on the uh, existing situation and the, let's say, evolution of the situation in water resources in Central Asia and particularly in Kazakhstan. Both of them have very extensive experience and exposure with 
Central Asia and particularly with Kazakhstan again. As uh, His Excellency Ashok Tajankar was ambassador to Kazakhstan and uh, he recently published a very fundamental article on the state of bilateral relations. Uh, ambassador Dogra was in the, in the shoes of uh, Mr. Ajay Bisadia, who is now joint secretary. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, previously, now, yes, uh, Ashok uh, very uh, holds this honor and this uh, responsibility. Of course, I think that uh, 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 His Excellency Ambassador Sajan Har was quite eloquent in uh, describing the current situation and the history of the... Uh, yes, okay? Yes, and uh, the current status of the water problem, I mean transboundary water problem. Uh, and uh, I also am thankful to both experts and to our main speaker, Mr. Senior, who, who I think uh, was uh, absolutely correct in bringing the, to our attention the parallels that exist between the water situation in two regions in South Asia and Central Asia in uh, bringing us to the existing differences and variations in the situation. And of course, I am thankful to uh, the representative of World Bank, Dr. Yang. Uh, I understand he also was, uh, has an experience uh, of dealing with the water problems in the region of Central Asia as well. Well, I think that the main, I cannot add too much uh, to the description of the situation and to the, let's say, technical and uh, scientific side uh, and aspects of the existing problem. I think that main issues are this, that the water situation remains acute and probably the prospects for the amelioration or the progress with this situation are still very bleak. Uh, second, it is, and uh, what is uh, the most concerning that we have in Central Asia, the area of the ecological, environmental catastrophe, disaster, that is Aral Sea. Second, we have the deterioration and degradation uh, uh, of the situation with water resources in some other areas, uh, for instance, Balhash Lake, and all those concerns are related to the transboundary water problem. <coughs> Second aspect is that the environmental situation affects a lot lifestyles and economic activities of the broad parts of the population of uh, Central Asia, Kazakhstan included. And this uh, creates constraints for lifestyles, for the standards of living, and for the economy of the regions concerned. The third aspect is that uh, in Central Asia there is a, an issue that became a point of, uh, of a certain debate whether energy problem and water problems are correlated and in which way this correlation should be sort of uh, translated into uh, instruments of international law, agreements, uh, sharing 
uh, arrangements and so on and so forth. This is also so. Being such a complex issue that of real concern to the vast groups of population in the region, and with the with the real um, threat and implications for the development of the environmental situation in the region, of economic status of the region, it is very obvious that uh, the countries of the region were driven to try to find joint answers and responses to the situation. And uh, we should, uh, of course, uh, state that uh, limited success has been done in terms of creating mechanism to jointly discuss and try to find solutions for the existing problems. First of all, Central Asian countries did approve, did uh, the framework agreement on the water and energy resources of the basin of uh, Sirdaria River. It was in 1998. Since then, all the parties concerned have to hold regular consultations and debates on the existing quotas of, uh, uh, of use of waters and uh, the, the management of the waters of River Sintaria. Uh, and uh, it is very complex and uh, process. We do have pitfalls in this process. And we cannot really state so far that this arrangement works uh, the way it suits and it satisfies the needs of parties concerned. It is one. We also are cooperating with Kyrgyz Republic in the water management and use of water resources with uh, uh, on Chu and Talas rivers that are transboundary for both of our countries. And it is both the people on the more technical side and on the political side, we try to elaborate and design the better schemes for us to share this, taking into account, of course, the needs for agricultural use, the concerns of Kyrgyz side for the use of overproduction of the energy uh, on the rivers. And uh, it is also, we have a special commission, bilateral commission that debates those issues uh, regularly, not less than twice a year. We do participate, and Kazakhstan is one of the most active participants to the international Aral Fund, Aral Sea Fund, and uh, we, uh, within this fund you have several uh, bodies like international, intergovernment, interstate coordination commission and interstate commission on sustainable development. And Kazakhstan, in cooperation with international bodies, World Bank and others, is the most active uh, in developing programs to try to 
to, 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 to find solutions for the, at least for the northern part of now the RLCs act. Uh, in fact, it is two big lakes or water bodies and the north part is uh, the, the degradation at least was stopped uh, during last years thanks to this international program uh, that was uh, developed with the support <coughs> and under the guidance of uh, the World Bank. It is, uh, there were several programs on the assistance to countries of the basin of RLC. And uh, we are the, uh, I think, among those who implement the most actively those issues. And uh, the fact that in 2008, International Arrow Fund was recognized and uh, given the observer status at the General Assembly of the UN General Assembly is one of the uh, uh, evidences that this uh, problem is recognized globally. We, I think that one of the most important parts for our uh, country is uh, the use uh, the, the, the issue of transboundary water management and uh, environmental management of the Irtysh and Ili rivers with the uh, People's Republic of China. And uh, since 1998, we, we have some steps forward in discussing these problems with uh, Ch uh, the Republic of China. You may know that uh, we have on the political side very good level of understanding with China. Economically, countries develop progressively uh, our bilateral trade investment and uh, cooperation. And uh, I think there are <coughs> all the all the political prerequisites for us to to solve uh, the problems of trans boundary use of water resources in a in a uh, constructive and cooperative manner. Nevertheless, there are there is a huge and dynamic development of Xinjiang uh, autonomous region of China that uh, grows very high uh, in the last 20 years. And uh, there is an increase in physical terms of population of the economic activity in the region. And both of them creates more pressure on the existing resource, water resources and water flow of the rivers. And uh, our main speaker was uh, saying about the issue of uh, the Lake Balhash. Yes, some, uh, some uh, academics, they, I understand that I'm Yes, yes, I should be, Please. yes, I, I, I'm not stopping here, but I, uh, I only say that with China, at least what we have, we have intergovernmental commission. We have several documents signed, and we should develop the, I think that the issue of, uh, we, it is, it is uh, the, 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 we should develop uh, more efficient <coughs> instruments and tools in order to try to introduce equitative, Correct. equitative and uh, equitative approach to solve those issues with the main concern about environmental consequences and implications. And 
the last point is that uh, Indian experience, South Asian experience, for us it is very important, though I would uh, say that uh, we don't have any specific uh, type of consultations on this problem so far with India. This is uh, just a constatation for both of our side. Yes, I understand that uh, I am off the limit, so thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. And my apologies, I think you were making this very important point about the Kazakh experience in dealing with its water. It just struck me as you were speaking, you know, when you were emphasizing the need for equitable arrangements, that when we talk about water as a very, very important resource, I was just thinking that in the Indian experience, you know, if you go back, for instance, to one of our most ancient texts in terms of statecraft, we talk about the Arthashastra. Many of you may have heard of it. And there it talks about the duties that devolve upon the ruler. In those days, it was the emperor. To deal with national resources, the <coughs> resources of the state, of the exchequer. And the central point made, and I'm paraphrasing this, is that the management of those resources in the interest of the state and its people should be equitable, it should be harmonious and it should be sustainable. Those are the three elements. And I was just thinking that one could perhaps apply the same yardstick and say that now if you look at water in the larger regional context, whether it's what Dr. Young said or what Professor Chalani said or our distinguished ambassadors, we need to inculcate that it is a common shared resource. And the policies being enunciated now have to meet this test, that they are equitable in terms of the sharing and the policy is sustainable and also harmonious in the very larger matrix of climate and so on. And I hope the SPS does plan that at some future point we can invite our Chinese colleagues and get a sense from them as to how they see this very important issue. But on that note, I'll now request the Excellency, the Ambassador from Turkmenistan, but before I invite him, We'll do a little bit of rearrangement. I know Ajay has to leave us, but no, no problem. But can I request those who are sitting at the back to please come up? We have enough place. And I think all our speakers would like to see a full table. You know, So those of you who are sitting at the black, back, please come up. There's lots of space. Aniket, etc., you can come up and use the, tape, chairs, the chairs on this side. Ranjana, please come. There's lots of place. Can I, Dennis, can I request you to please come up? May I also recognize Ambassador Dennis Cooks? He's one of the foremost commentators in U.S. academia and diplomatic history on South Asia. I gathered he was staying here at the IIC, so I've hijacked him. Dennis, thank you for being here. Now, on that note, I'll invite His Excellency, the Ambassador of uh, Turkmenistan. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Olaji. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm sorry for being late, uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, with your help, I'll try to catch up and uh, try to give you some uh, ideas of uh, Turkmenistan's view on the water policy. Uh, I also would like to um, uh, comment the words that uh, Udayjiu mentioning in uh, Arta Shastra, that those words are very much uh, replicated, uh, or maybe some to some extent uh, was used in the Adat, which is the um, uh, common law in uh, practically all the Muslim countries, and especially in Central Asia. So with these words, I just wanted to start uh, my speech um, with the... Uh, very much important topic that water is, uh, that uh, for Turkmen's water uh, is represented with a very uh, interesting uh, proverb saying uh, that uh, a drop of water is a grain of, wa of gold, or a carrot of gold, if you want, uh, including those of uh, conservation, restoration of uh, water and other natural resources, uh, desertification, uh, soil degradation, uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, we not only uh, set, um, uh, ratified a number of UN uh, um, uh, conventions on this, on the matter, for example, Convention on Biodiversity, Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, Convention on, uh, to Combat uh, Desertification, UNESCO Convention on, uh, Concerning the Protection of the World Natural, Cultural Natural Heritage, Convention on the Protection of Use of Transboundary Water Courses, and International Lakes are uh, known as Water Convention, and many others. 
And of course, uh, uh, our president was mentioning all those issues and uh, um, related uh, problems uh, to uh, generally to environmental pollution and especially to water issues at the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference, which was held in 2012 at the Rio de Janeiro. Um, ecological aspects like uh, rational use of na uh, natural uh, resources are the main feature in economic uh, development of the country. In the area of combating the climate change, Turkmenistan has developed a strategy which stipulates establishment and development of high-tech industries uh, for the benefit of people's social welfare through the wide usage of green uh, economy. Uh, in this regard, the construction of uh, the Alton Asir uh, uh, Lake in the middle of the Garolam Desert uh, becomes uh, very much important since it is uh, um, intended to gather all the uh, drained and uh, used uh, uh, water at the agricultural uh, fields uh, to be stored in one place and then uh, reused for uh, for the second time. It is important also to mention that uh, this uh, project will be uh, co collecting uh, uh, drainage water throughout the uh, region, including Uzbekistan and maybe even Kazakhstan, uh, to a certain extent to to uh, to create an art artificial lake in the uh, natural depression, which is known as the Garashor at the middle, uh, which was the former uh, riverbed of, uh, uh, or known as Uzboy in Amudarya River when it was uh, flowing towards Caspian Sea. Uh, of course, the first uh, stage of this uh, 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 natural lake, uh, it was created, uh, started in uh, July 2009, and uh, the, the president of Turkmenistan, of course, uh, uh, pays very much uh, great importance to it. The, the length of this, um, <coughs> Uh, uh, the total system of collectors that we have at this moment, uh, which is directed to play towards uh, that uh, system, is uh, 720 kilometers, uh, with um, uh, uh, the lake's uh, length is uh, 103 kilometers, with uh, eight, nine, 18 kilometers in width and uh, average depth of 69 meters, and can. Uh, <coughs> accumulate uh, 132 cubic uh, kilometers of water at the surface area of, of uh, 3.5 uh, thousand square kilometers. Of course, this will be uh, rapidly uh, increasing towards uh, as much we uh, start to the, the accumulate the water over there. But at this moment, I can tell you that uh, this uh, water body already changed the ecological system of the whole region towards a better side because it started creating some wetlands and already dried up uh, before, and uh, some uh, uh, migratory birds, birds are uh, already making their uh, uh, nests in their uh, in that uh, area. Uh, this, um, of course, the collection of this uh, drainage water will help us uh, to prevent, uh, uh, you know, discharging this uh, uh, used and drainage water into the natural um, depressions like Amudarya River or any other. Or RLC or any other place. So it means that, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, the attempts of my government is going towards the uh, limitation of uh, um, drainage water into the uh, natural water system, which is uh, flowing towards RLC. Um, <coughs> of course, uh, <coughs> um, that uh, the uh, Altunasar. Um, uh, lake, which is now created, uh, will be, of course, uh, a source of uh, uh, fresh water after the desalination and its uh, natural uh, filtration uh, for, again, for using other um, agricultural lands. And uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, uh, very good uh, for the uh, upgrading those uh, already uh, been uh, salinized and industrially, uh, uh, you know, um, Lands which were already prevented from uh, from uh, uh, use uh, for, for for further use. Of course, in uh, in our um, view, the uh, the idea is that uh, the security itself is not uh, just um, uh, uh, can. Uh, it is uh, very much an idea of. Uh, um, Consolidated and very much of comprehensive uh, I idea. That is, uh, and water security is just one component of it. It is 
all related and energy security linked to it very much that uh, if uh, upper uh, stream uh, countries uh, start doing dams and uh, uncontrollably doing all these things of course will lead uh, to some uh, industrial and uh, of course environmental problems to the lower riparian states. Um, of course in the uh, course of the uh, uh, history um, the RLC is one of the uh, major disasters and uh, we acknowledge that and we do all the best whatever we are able to do in order to preserve it and uh, uh, the uh, this um, lake that I was mentioning is one of the uh, solutions to this and uh, from our side uh, the uh, we have uh, created a special uh, uh, contingency plans and uh, we have a program of ecological uh, rehabilitation and all these things for the <coughs> lands that uh, already been degraded by the overuse of water. Of course, cotton is one of the major imports, uh, export uh, uh, commodities of Turkmenistan, but it is not an overwhelming one, of course. Uh, and it, of course, it plays uh, some role in the uh, GDP, but uh, doesn't uh, make uh, much uh, uh, to the, uh, I would say, um, to the creation of that problem that, of course, uh, and because we are now diverting, uh, trying to device, diversify the agricultural products uh, into other low intensity and plus using more, uh, more of uh, the advanced uh, achievements of the uh, technological uh, development. Uh, then, uh, of course, and finally, uh, I had a lot of uh, points here, but since I am very much limited in time, I just wanted to uh, point out that, of course, uh, for uh, ecological uh, betterment of the country, the tree planting um, campaigns that we do every year are playing a major role. And uh, this year we're planning again uh, to plant some uh, three million uh, saplings uh, around the cities and uh, all the uh, areas where uh, the uh, scarcity of water is, uh, you know, uh, getting more. Um, worse, worse affected areas. And, uh, and finally, as a uh, water is, uh, um, since it is a, a source of uh, energy and life, the centrally um, is the central to nearly every uh, major challenge and opportunity to, to the world that uh, faces today. It can be a uniting as well as confronting factor. Uh, but as a responsible member of the uh, international community, Turkmenistan uh, looks far beyond and uh, treats uh, the first one as an example opportunity and uh, priority in this foreign policy. As an example here, I would like to uh, uh, bring uh, to attention to, the, uh, uh, to this august audience that uh, there is the Dostluk Dam, which is uh, constructed on the uh, river Tejen, which is flowing from Afghanistan and Iran towards uh, Turkmenistan where uh, we have a 50-50 uh, share uh, uh, agreement between Iranian uh, government and uh, uh, practically this is one of the uh, one of the important steps towards uh, uh, you know um, putting some sort of uh, uh, forward thinking into the transboundary sharing of waters uh, water resources and all this thank you very much thank you excellency again my apologies i can see that you had a very detailed text but when we come back to the QA, hopefully some of these issues can be raised again. Allow me now to recognize our uh, representative from the Embassy of Tajikistan, Mr. Usman Ali Saidale. Sir, you have the floor. Distinguished Chairman and uh, other uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am with my colleague, two diplomats from our Tajikistan Embassy. We are very thankful to, to the Chairman of Asia News Agency and uh, to the Chairman of Society for Policy Studies uh, <coughs> for invitation and for holding uh, such kind of very useful round table uh, for whole Central Asian, uh, not only for whole Central Asian region, for South Asian region also, <coughs> and uh, in agenda, in the program of your uh, round table, you uh, organizers included uh, five very important issues, and uh, within these uh, problems, 
within the consideration of uh, these problems and discuss discussion uh, about uh, on these problems. We, you also uh, included here uh, one very important uh, point. Uh, it is fifth. <coughs> Can India play a larger regional role? Uh, you see this, uh, yes, it is a very important issue uh, uh, because uh, India also as country as upper stream country, like <coughs> Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Yes, uh, because I don't forget, for, forget one very important uh, point. And uh, organizer, uh, organizers of the uh, round table uh, included in uh, their uh, <coughs> consent note concept note that uh, <coughs> Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are poorest countries. Please, in this regard, I, as diplomat, as representative of uh, Embassy of Tajikistan, uh, have to express my disappointment. And uh, please, uh, not Tajikistan, not Kyrgyzstan, they are not poorest countries. They are rich countries. That's why, please, in future, such kind of uh, remarks, notes, don't include the in concepts of uh, note. And uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, larger regional role of India, uh, I already uh, can uh, remind you that uh, a, a representative of the government of uh, uh, India, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Mr. Ajay Bisaria, uh, he already uh, mentioned, underlined that how CASA 1000 is important not only for Tajikistan, it's important for whole Central Asian region and also for South Asian uh, region. For Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. And uh, why I am uh, especially underlining this uh, point? Because uh, you know, this uh, last day, day, days, even last days, some of our neighbor, uh, neighboring countries uh, uh, announcing that it is CASA 1000, it is not important, it is, we don't follow it. Uh, you see how? Representative of World Bank, uh, please he's sitting there. They are in our in in Central Asia and particularly in Tajikistan. They are working within ten years, ten years, and they are working on our energy projects and particularly this uh, uh, Ragun Ragun projects, which which without permission of uh, uh, World Bank, without conclusion of, of uh, World Bank Tajikistan. Not cancer. You see, that's why uh, I should uh, uh, accept of uh, largest role of India. I also should underline very huge role of World Bank in the uh, in keeping of uh, stabiliza stabilization in Central Asia region and uh, particularly uh, in Tajikistan. And. Uh, uh, in the beginning of this uh, round table, uh, former ambassador of Kazakhstan, uh, His Excellency Mr. Aja, uh, Ashok Sajanhar, Sajanhar, you see, uh, yes, uh, we are uh, still very uh, uh, small already, already small diplomats, but uh, ambassador Mr. Ashok Sajandar, Sajanhar, long time, he uh, uh, worked in Kazakhstan, in one the, or in one of the countries uh, located in downstream uh, of rivers. You see, and uh, he uh, very good, very well uh, uh, appointed, uh, uh, underlined that Uzbekistan uses uh, sixty percent of water. 
of volume of volume of water of Central Asia. Turkmenistan, uh, Mr. Ashok told uh, 70 percent of all whole uh, volume, but maybe it is le uh, maybe they uses less, not 70, maybe less than 70 percent. And Kazakhstan uses only 10 percent, 10 percent of all water. Uh, and sir, also Mr. Uh, Ashok uh, underlined about uh, cotton and uh, grain. He meant uh, uh, wheat and uh, rice. Sir, I, right now I don't uh, remember exact, but I, but I know cotton uses water maybe 10 or 20 percent more than uh, rice and uh, wheat. wheat. With. And uh, that's why uh, uh, Mr. Ashok uh, uh, mentioned one very important uh, uh, point that only Uzbekistan with extensive cotton and agricultural irrigation alone accounting for more than half of the region's water consumption. It is not, I am uh, telling about this day, uh, today, he is not sitting Mr. Uh, Bekzad Alimjanov uh, next to me, not because this uh, representative of uh, Uzbekistan not uh, attended. We, uh, with him, uh, visited uh, uh, Kolkata with His Excellency uh, Ambassador of the Turkmenistan, and we there cooperated very well, and I today also was waiting uh, for his visit to share uh, about these uh, problems, but unfortunately mm, it is not uh, <coughs> for that I blame some country or uh, something. And, uh, okay, uh, <coughs> two words uh, I want to uh, uh, inform you about uh, some points of our uh, global policy regional and global water policy of Tajikistan. Forming almost 60% of the water flow of the area Aral Sea Rivers Basin, Tajikistan has generously shared water resources with its neighbors. So out of 64 <coughs> kilometer cubic water formed on its territory, on our territory, the country uses only 10 that's 11 cubic kilometers from 64 cubic kilometers, representing 10% of the total runoff basin. And at that time, when the country specific indicators of water volume and irrigated area per capita in Central Asia are the lowest. Uh, Tajikistan, along with other countries in the region, annually allocates additional water to support environmental systems of the Aral Sea and Aral Sea region. So, for 1992 and 2010, Aral Sea and the Aral Sea region, on an average, allocated 12.1 km cubic of water per year, which is slightly more than the annual limit of Tajikistan in order to provide the population of Central Asia uh, with clean drinking water Tajikistan proposed the creation of the international consortium for the use of clean fresh water of Sares Lake in the face of the water supply deficit rise observed in the region the project is certainly met with special attention it should be noted that this significantly reduces the risk of breakthrough of the breakthrough of this lake which threatens the lives of six million people in afghanistan tajikistan uzbekistan and turkmenistan Global level actions of the country on water are characterized yes, 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 by the desire to attract more, more attention of the world community to address water issues and improve water <coughs> cooperation. The country actively promotes water issues on the global agenda and is the initiator of almost all water resolutions 
of United Nations General Assembly in the past decade. It was a suggestion of the government of Republic of Tajikistan that the International Year of Fresh Water 2003, International Decade for Action, Water for Life, 2005-2015, and the International Year of Water Cooperation, 2013, were, de were declared, that the concept of which is the idea of giving high priority to water issues and taking appropriate actions to resolve them at all levels. During this period, Dushanbe City uh, repeatedly provided a, a forum to discuss water issues at the global level and to make recommendations and uh, measures for their uh, effective solution. I think uh, this uh, remove and uh, leave it. It is clear that solidarity, potential joint efforts, and the use of effective and <coughs> adequate approaches and mechanisms will guarantee achieving success in this regard. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. I want to thank the esteemed representative of Uzbekistan for, I think, very detailed, sorry, Tajikistan for very detailed remarks and that he had, I think, uh, made some very important references to critical issues. And I hope we can take them up in the question and answer. But, sir, I just want to assure you that, you know, when the concept note had used the word poorest, it was not in any, I would say, less than objective manner. And we are meeting here in a track two forum. And it is both solidarity and affectionate solidarity that brings all of us here together. So that word, please do not take it amiss. It was meant in a purely objective way, only in reference to some of the indicators, but I shall convey your point to the concerned people on that. I will request the uh, uh, Ambassador Ashok Sajanhar when he makes his concluding remarks, I think, to specifically respond to some of the points you made. Now that we've had the benefit of listening to the views of the <coughs> Central Asian uh, ambassadors and representatives here with us this afternoon, I will now turn to our other Indian experts who are all here and who have a focus which is specific to South Asia and the challenges here. If I may, first I'll recognize Secretary D.V. Singh. He was formerly Secretary in uh, the Water Resources Ministry and someone who has contributed extensively both to the evolution and the pursuit of India's policies in this regard. D.V. sir, all yours. Thank you. <coughs> it's been very interesting listening to all the problems of the Central Asian Republics. I'll try and keep it as short as possible and perhaps only give some solutions which we've tried to do here in South Asia. Number one, water scarcity is a given and the situation will deteriorate as the population increases. Per capita availability will go down. The quicker there is a framework for agreement, for sharing or whatever, the easier it will be. The more there is delay in any agreement, the more there is delay in coming to an understanding, the more difficult it gets. In India, we have even started saying, let us agree to share, not surplus, to share distress. Because if you ask a country, let us share your surplus, or ask a region, share your surplus water, they say we don't have. So we believe in sharing distress. Look at it that way, and work on it that way. Number two, what we learned is bilateral agreements are easier to reach. Unlike my friend, Mr. Young from the World Bank, who believes in multilateral uh, forums, we find it's easier to negotiate between two people because they're only one set of conflicting interests. When there's a third country involved, it pulls things in three different directions, much more difficult. Perhaps I would suggest that this is the way to go ahead. Number three, do not go into consultative agreements. For example, the Mekong Agreement. There, if some country has an objection, all they can do is sit and consult. If you do have to have an agreement, you have to have a water sharing agreement, it should be enforceable. 
It should be that, yes, you have done this, we agree to this, you have not done this, I will take you to court, or whatever system you have. Please do it that way. Number four, I think the most important, the very, very most important, which has been missed, which is normally missed in our country also, is the mistrust. A lot of speakers, in fact, I'm sorry, Mr. Commander, I mean, uh, Mr. Brahmachalani is not here. They've written books on it. They've written books on how China affects the Brahmaputra, how it can divert all the water and starve India. It's not factual. It's incorrect. The Tibetan region is what is called a rain shadow. There is very little precipitation there. The total water which comes from the Brahmaputra into India at the border is 80 BCM. BCM stands for billion cubic meters, leave that. It's just 80. When it leaves India for Bangladesh, the amount of water is 680. We don't even utilize 1% of it. Yet the scenario which is created in the public, which is created by our experts, books are written about it. China is building 35 dams. Yes, they are. It doesn't make a difference to us. They are generating electricity. There is no agriculture in Tibet. They can't store water and irrigate fields. The problem is ours. We don't know how to use that 600 BCM of water which is generated from the Himalayas, this side of it. Similarly, we talk of other rivers, the Ganga, the Yamuna, etc., all originating from China. <coughs> Snow melt only accounts for 5%. There are glaciers melting away. Yes, there's a truth in that. But look at the broader picture. What I'm trying to say is you can only have an informed dialogue and understanding if this mistrust is, improved, uh, is removed. China cries horse. We only have 8% of the Brahmaputra's catchment, 8% of the river. We don't agree with it. And it's all facts. We talk of Pakistan. We've got... Uh, a very good agreement with them. It was a good time when we had it because in 1947 one of our provinces stopped water to Pakistan. Pakistan threw a fit and the World Bank fortunately came in. We were both in need of World Bank loans so they managed to get an agreement. That sort of crisis may not come again. But the point is when Pakistan took us to court or to the arbitration court, it was not because of sharing of water. It was because of something else. They said in your dams, you are making sluices or outlets below the water. What you can do is, you can open these all together and flood Pakistan. That was the issue in Baglihar. Huh? That was the issue in Kishanganga. You have to understand in water is an emotive issue. It does not lead very well to facts. We are so involved in it. It's our food, it's our this, it's that, it's fantastic. For example, again coming back to Brahmaputra, if China, for example, manages to divert all the water from Brahmaputra to it wherever it wants to take it and sends us zero water in the lean season, the maximum effect it will make is that our first power station in the upper Siang will lose 50% power in the lean season. That's about it. But what I'm trying to say is that neighboring countries, the people, the experts, at times find it more convenient to go on a certain stream of facts which are not conducive to water security. What is always works best is before you go into water sharing is please go into things like improving water efficiencies in the region, non-controversial. Say, let's do this. Let's both try and increase the amount of uh, efficient use of water. Let's have Bureau of Water Efficiencies. Let's try and remove water waste. Once you start talking on this, uh, we have noticed in our uh, region, it then leads slowly, slowly to an understanding. And again, for example, Bangladesh, I don't know if there's anyone from there. Uh, earlier, there was supposed to be. They're so hung up on the Tista. We should have the Tista agreement. Without the Tista agreement, you are getting 90% of the water. You want the Tista agreement, which will give you only 
But that's what he probably wants. That's what you're pressing all this while. Bengal is not using the water. We cannot eat it flooded. It can't have a dam anywhere. It has no canals to utilize it. You're aware of the position. But the political scenario, the polit political imperative is there has to be a Tista agreement. And we laugh about it. We say, yeah, of course, there has to be one. We we'll sign it also. But please, have you just checked up as to without this agreement, how much water are you getting? And with this agreement, what are you committing yourselves to? It's, you have to understand that at times, the dynamics of politics and the dynamics of the people and the dynamics of the expert distorts ground reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dhruv Singh. I think you have shed valuable light on both the perception and the reality. And I hope that through the SPS, SAM and ANA, you will be able to keep this alive in terms of trying to give us more facts about the various emotive perceptions on the water issue. On that note, allow me now to introduce and welcome Sanjoy Hazarika. He is currently the director for the Centre for Northeast Studies at Jamia and has done extensive work in the Northeast and on these issues. And he's also done some very, I would say, uh, poignant work on the Brahmaputra. Sanjay, all yours. Uh, excellencies and friends, um, I was going to speak on a few other things, but uh, I'll slightly respond to Mr. Singh's uh, remarks. Because I think that uh, it will be part of what I'm saying, because uh, when you think of water and you think of rivers, what do you think of? Do you think of strategy? Do you think of great dams? What do you think of? You think of good things. You think of beauty, music. These are cultural entities. These are great entities by themselves. You know, our poets, our scholars, our writers, our filmmakers, our theater people, they have all been inspired by rivers and water. So let's stop thinking about them just as things to be dammed pushed, cut, damaged, devastated. Water and rivers are part of a larger paradigm, a larger network of, of uh, if you look at the Himalayas, if you look at Central Asia, the mountains and valleys there, the forests, the ecosystems. And um, I uh, over the past uh, 20 years, I've been spending a lot of time in Assam, traveling along the Brahmaputra and its tributaries, and uh, also in Tibet, traveling in Tibet and Myanmar and Bangladesh. And I speak essentially from the field as also as somebody who tries to span the worlds of media and uh, academia. It's true, <coughs> China is not diverting the water. They're just building the cascade dams to link the two where the Sangpo loops. Just before the great Namcha Barwa bend, there will be nine <coughs> dams which are, will be built, including nine cascades to generate 42,000 megawatts of electricity. So they're really going to release about the same amount of water <coughs> that was traveling around uh, in a shorter space of time. That's the plan. I mean, all this stuff about moving it north and east was all tight line, and they saw the responses. Everybody reacted the way they did. What people don't understand is the Brahmaputra, the Sangpa Brahmaputra is essentially not just a braided river, it has 40 rivers that flow into it. It also is a major carrier of silt basically builds nations, it builds valleys. It is, if you look at satellite imagery of the Brahmaputra, although it is not the longest river in the world, it is one of the greatest because the alluvial plans of the Brahmaputra stretch up to the tip of Indonesia. It goes well beyond Bangladesh and its effects affect the eastern coastline of India. So it is uh, 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 an entity <coughs> that is building, helping Bangladesh in a way uh, gain more territory. 
So when you put this water through 11 uh, dams and sets of turbines, what happens? The Chinese are among the best at developing clean water. So you take the sand out. So what you have is a fresh flow of water with very little sediment road which will cut like a knife through butter, through sandbanks, because the entire valley of the Brahmaputra, it is a very flat valley, and it is uh, characterized by extensive flood plains. The river in its most, in its largest extent is 18 kilometers wide. At the narrowest, it can be a few hundred meters. And uh, what we need to understand is that with the processes of climate change which are happening and are inevitable, we are seeing the results of this in the valley of the of Assam. Thus, we are seeing extreme periods of dry spells and very aggressive periods of storms and uh, high water. People are migrating, people are moving out. This is one of the areas where there was less migration. It was one of the least mobile areas of Asia. Today, we have an extensive movement out into other parts of India as a result of devastation of agricultural lands and uh, the entire life cycle. Today, uh, we find that in parts of Assam, it's a small state, only 30 million people, 32 million people. By the standards of India, it's tiny. In some places, of our research has shown that 43% of household income is coming from remittances. People have moved to Kerala, Goa, Tamil Nadu, and so on. And this is as much a failure of government and governance as it is the, of the capacities to, to build capacity to adapt. Because people don't know how to adapt. Four months of the year, you're under water. Eight months, you're dealing with dry, a dry condition. So it's very well to talk about these things here. But for us, since many of us work in the field, uh, it is something that is extremely disturbing and something that makes you wonder about uh, issues of sensitivity and understanding between Delhi and, and I think there's a, there's a huge gap in understanding and uh, the reality. This talk, I say talk, about many dams being built in Arunachal, there is a huge movement against this. I'm not saying whether the movement is good or the movement is bad against dams. I'm not talking about that. But people are never consulted. Today's day, this is not the democracy it was 60 years ago. Today people will say, I have a right to be heard. I have a right to be here. You have to convince me. You have to tell me what the issues are. And just holding a few preliminary hearings doesn't take the problem away. I mean, these are the things that will create security problems. Because people who are frustrated turn ultimately to other ways of dealing with problems. This is a very sensitive area as far as conflict and confrontation is concerned. And I think we need to be acutely aware of that. And dialogue at every level is, is uh, what is critical. Um, can you bring about, we have heard uh, representatives of government speak, former representatives, people who uh, are in uh, think tanks and so on who present a particular point of view, obviously there needs to be change, yes, but that, can that change be inclusive? If it can't be inclusive, then you're really looking at a situation where you'll have more confrontation and conflict. Not because there's more water or less water, but because people just don't understand each other. And instead, and I am absolutely not in favor of a donor-driven campaign. I'm sorry, Mr. Priyan, 
Uh, I think that uh, the, the bank is making efforts to change its approach and is discussing now with state governments and so on, but often the state governments themselves don't have any clear discussions with the principal stakeholders, which are the communities. So donor-led, top-heavy, uh, driven campaign or uh, policy, these are not these are not going to work. Um, so I would call for increasing sensitivity on these issues. I think that is something that really doesn't stand any more uh, coherence because uh, the ministry he represented does not even release information about river waters. How are we supposed to research if we don't even have the information? There's classified information on Ferris in most of the countries of the region, not just India. You know, so we all work on hypotheses, extrapolation, or information that we get from the net or from other scholars across the world. If we are to truly work on a dialogue, you have to be transparent. In a democracy, we call ourselves a democracy, you have to be truly, truly transparent. That's one. And the last point I'd like to flag is that for <coughs> on and off, there are these uh, noises being made about the interlinking of rivers uh, in different, uh, in India, by a particular, shall we say, right-wing party, which may have formed the government. Now, I think this is one of the most disastrous ideas that has been uh, uh, pushed in the public arena. Some of us opposed it 10 years ago, and we will continue to oppose it, because it does not simply uh, look at the fact that all these rivers affect lower riparian. India is a lower riparian as far as the Brahmaputra is concerned, and Bangladesh is another lower riparian. So whatever happens anywhere affects other lower riparians within the country as well as outside the country. Thanks. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, again, I think you have a lot to bring to the table and the discussion. I'm not quite sure how much time we will have to actually engage fruitfully in Q&A, but I'll see how best to nudge the time. Let me now invite Mr. Jaydeep Gupta. Again, senior journalist and now working on many of the environmental related issues under the AGs of Third Pole, which he's the director of. Jaydeep, all yours. Thanks, Uday. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I know we are running horribly short of time, so I'm not going to basically talk. I'm just going to mention the main thing I wanted to mention. The main thing I want to mention is that negotiations between governments on water by them, by itself is what the economists call a necessary but not a sufficient condition. It's We have found, in, especially in recent years, as Bill's um, graph showed, number of agreements are going down. And that is because governments, diplomats, bureaucrats, hydrocrats are speaking to one another and are not being inclusive. And if you start from a negotiations point of view, where you start from the point of view that I must give, in, give the least and extract the most, this is not a situation where uh, which will be resolved in any way. A river is not a water pipe which you allocate between countries so many square feet, uh, 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 cubic meters per day or per year. Yes, that was the way the in Indus Water Treaty allocated. We know in India, and I have, having studied it, I can say that the Indus Water Treaty is more than generous to the downstream country Pakistan. But we must understand also that that is not the way it's seen in Pakistan. Right, right, right through the summer months, a regular page one heading in the Pakistani media is that India is stealing our water. Right through the summer months, it's a regular heading in Bangladeshi media that India is stealing our water. So we have a Faraka agreement, we have a, a Faraka barrage, we have a Ganga agreement, we have an Indus water treaty, and the result is that both downstream countries think that we are stealing their water. Similarly, we accuse China of stealing our water. 
this is obviously not the way to go about resolving anything whether whether it's here or in central asia i know all central asian countries i'm not going to go into the details the representatives have, have had sim very similar debates and they have been similarly rancorous in their debates in their national media so to me it starting from government to government level starting at what's called track 1 is simply not going to work you have to start at whatever you wish to call it you can call it track 5 4 3 or a track 2 like this and that has to involve the people who are actually dependent on this water there is no river in this world forget about central asia or south asia where people are not dependent on the use of that water on a day to day basis and that's where that's why i i heard earlier that there is bureaucratic will but not political will and that's why it's not working why is there lack of political will because politicians <coughs> realize that they they need this when they need the support they have to get the support if the if they're not getting any support from below they're not going to go for it and this is exactly what's happening it's only when you involve the people who are actually living in the banks that this will work in both central and south asia it's becoming a more and more important issue as the days go by because of two reasons one is climate change which is creating many more uncertainties on the water flow the other is the whole series of dams we do not know uh, to what extent that will affect many of these are now run of the river uh, schemes so water flow may not be affected in the in the long run but as sanjay pointed out the en entire deltas can get very badly affected due to lack of silt and silt definitely is held back otherwise the turbines blades will break you you cannot have the silt running through uh, a hydro turbine that doesn't work share what i was very heartened to hear ajay bisaria say that um, india is talking to kyrgyzstan and tajikistan on small hydropower yes we need hydropower many hydro stations are possibly one of the most benign of the uh, interferences we can make for energy and I'm very glad that India is doing that, and I wish that all the best. As Uday pointed out uh, from the Arthashastra, equitable, harmonious, and sustainable are the three points that we are trying to get to from here. This is, I mean, I work for a news website which does this on a day-to-day -day basis. What I find is that negotiators talk of equity rarely talk of harmony and almost never talk of sustainability to to get to that i think one of the things that negotiators need to talk about and this for what what it's worth is what i would say to my colleagues from kazakhstan because i do know about lake balkash and uh, right now it's going the rlc way it's definitely going the rlc way unless steps are taken immediately so if Kazakhstan, yes, it has a 2001 agreement, it has a 2011 agreement, uh, uh, but none of them are have anything to do with flow. The first one is about research, the second one is about water pollution. Very good, but not enough. So the way the Tista thing, uh, on Tista, Bangladesh asked for minimum flow, and uh, Kazakhstan needs to ask China for minimum guaranteed flow. Bangladesh asked for minimum flow, because uh, I, Bangladeshis know that right now they are getting 90% of the water, but they are worried that because of the dams in Sikkim, they may not. In, again, it's a question of perception. <coughs> it's not necessarily a question only of fact. It is a question of presenting your fact in a way that is that, so that you can persuade your interlocutors all around. I think that's what diplomacy is all about. There are plenty of diplomats here. And I'm sure they know this much better than I do. Thank you. Thank you, Jaidi. Uh, again, I think many areas and issues that we can try and pick up in the QA. 
Now I'll recognize our uh, last speaker, the panelist, and as I said, the fact that he's last in no way detracts from his contribution to this area. He's also a former colleague of mine at the IDSA. So when I looked at his <coughs> entire list of speakers, I said, whom can I sort of expect the greatest indulgence? And Uttam Sinha's name presented itself. He's done a lot of work, you know, when he joined us in the IDSA from the media, in the environment and various related issues, water, Arctic, so on that note, Uttam, all yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Chair, and I've known the Chair, I don't know, a million years ago. <laughs> he would always say, find the gap if you're a good batsman. So being the last speaker, I guess I have this uh, tremendous amount of information and knowledge in front of me to conceive something of which I will focus the lens on South Asia <laughs> and talk about South uh, Asia as a hydro-political security complex keeping in mind that, of course, there will be no water wars, but the absence of war here does not necessarily mean that disputes will not happen. I think we'll see South Asia and the future of South Asia witnessing many disputes on the waterfront. And, and the challenge here is how to resolve those disputes, how to take these disputes uh, head on. Uh, Sanjay Hajorika was talking a bit about poetics, you know, water and politics, water and poetics go quite hand in hand. And Sanjay, you might like to read uh, uh, Laila Mehta's book on this, it's quite interesting. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, talking about another poet, Goethe, the German philosopher, he w he's noted of saying that water is a friendly element only if you are familiar with it and know how best to treat it. And in South Asia, we are familiar with the water issues, but we haven't really found ways and mechanism to deal with it effectively. And I'll, and I'll point out some of the, the familiarities of water, which is interesting to note. One, rivers in South Asia are transboundary in nature, largely speaking. And because it is transboundary in nature, it carries a lot of politics with it. Two. Water being the most shared resource in the world is also one of the most unruly resources. You don't have a stabilized legal regime around water issues. So you have to go by the politics of the day to resolve some of the sharing issues of water. The third familiarity of water in, in the South Asian context is uh, that water management within a country affects the <laughs> external relationship of water issues between countries. So within and between go quite hand in hand in the South Asian context. The fourth element of this familiarization in South Asia is that water is a mediated resource. For long we ignored the ecosystem from which we derive the water and logically we need to contribute it back to the ecosystem. So while water is available in the commons, it is not used like a common. So that's one familiarity in South Asia that, that we realize. And second uh, important element of this familiarization in water is that South Asia has been hydrologically well advanced in creating uh, a network of treaties and understanding, in a sense, to dilute the political and the emotive and the divisive nature of, of water issues in, in the region. While this familiarity exists, there are certain aspects which are creating disturbing trends in South Asia, which we need to cope up with. And that's where dispute resolution mechanism will come in. One, of course, water is viewed as an exponential function. The increasing demand of water in South Asia is going to exponentially increase uh, in terms of population, in terms of food production, in terms of energy requirement. The second aspect is the <laughs> nexus, which we've not discussed. Water is an essential element of the food energy nexus. So it has to be seen in a rather holistic manner and not in any sense in an isolated approach. The third aspect of this is that often in South Asia, we have ignored looking at the region from a hydrological lens. And if you put the hydrological lens in South Asia, we cannot no longer ignore China. China from a political construct in South Asia has been kept <coughs> at the margins, at best an observer in a regional organization like SARC. But from a hydrological construct, China is very much part of South Asia. And it's time that we understood China, it's time that we engaged with China, and it's time that we alerted China to many of the distresses that the downstream South Asian countries will witness in, in, in the near future. 
And one of the rapid changes, the unaccustomed, the unknowns that will emerge is the impact of climate change on water resources itself. Now, many of these transboundary rivers originate from the Himalayan region. And that is quite vulnerable to the climate change impact. But we shouldn't get carried away with the climate change impact because the science is not yet exact. We still need to investigate further on many of the issues of glaciers and many of the issues on the precipitation which we tend to ignore. So these element will be factored into uh, many of the disputes uh, that would arise. Now what are the mechanism that we have in South Asia? I think we have a history of good treaties in South Asia. Uh, the Indus Water Treaty is a reflection of that. It's a robust treaty. It might be a divorce settlement, but it still has elements within the treaty which reflects a certain dispute resolution spirit. For example, you have the permanent Indus Water Commissioners meeting every year. And there's no other uh, treaty in the subcontinent in which in spite of all the antagonism and in spite of all the fighting and, and the kind of uh, relationship that we have with Pakistan, uh, the Indus Permanent Water Commission has met 112 times in the last 52 years. And that's a great reflection of the robustness of this treaty. Within the treaty itself, you have an article which talks about future cooperation. So it is quite open-ended. And here we can bring in some new knowledge and new understandings on how and ways to uh, manage our water relationship through this article. On the, on, on the Nepal front, of course, we are at a low ripe period, but that doesn't really affect politically our relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Nepal. I think we need to build on some of the spirits of the treaties that we've had. Probably the first treaty in South Asia is the Sardha Treaty in, in the 1930s. So we can build on that spirit. There's too much of focus on hydropower between India and, and the Nepal relationship. We've ignored the navigational aspect of rivers. We ignored the flood and inundation aspects of, of, of the disasters that these rivers can, can bring forth, and therefore we need to focus a bit on that. We have these great joint uh, working groups with Nepal, and I think we need to introduce this new knowledge within those mechanisms. On Bangladesh, we have, of course, the saving principles of water, which again is a credible exercise. But within that Ganges Treaty is also the joint working groups, the joint working commission on rivers water, which itself is a, is a dispute resolving mechanism within the treaty itself. So, you know, South Asia, uh, often not talked about, has a deep uh, understanding of how to uh, settle its uh, uh, water relationship. Of course, it was looked at it more from bilateral level. And I think one of the biggest challenges now is to move towards the river basin organization. And that is a shift from the status quo position of how we deal with, with, with water issues in South Asia to a more brave new approach of looking at it from a river basin uh, perspective, which obviously will mean we'll have to look at it from a multi-actor perspective, which itself is you know, kind of moving our diplomacy into a different level, which we're not very much accustomed to. And therefore, there is a little resistance to this shift from a bilateral to a multilateral approach. And lastly, I think China, which I mentioned, cannot no longer be ignored in the hydrological context of South Asia. Uh, for, uh, for long, China remains silent uh, on its river issues. Uh, uh, what people say is the strategic silence on its rivers. Uh, it, it, it encashed a lot through fears and apprehensions of the downright variants. It did that in the Mekong. It cleverly did that on, on the Brahmaputra. But I think there's a learning curve in, in the leadership of Chinese in the way they're managing the rivers. They're coming out forthrightly. Not forthrightly. They're coming out little by little. They're trying to share some of the information on the Brahmaputra. It's no longer about diversions now, uh, 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 the Brahmaputra. Uh, but let, let's not get misled by the run of the river dams. Dams are destructive to rivers, and the kind of size and the capacity in which the Chinese are making these dams obviously have a downright period effect. But the idea here is that China is a supreme <coughs> upper country. It does not respect any of the legal regimes that it has. It does not respect the 1997 UN Non-Navigational Treaty. So you're not, you've, got to, you've got to deal with China and engage with them. And I think one of the elements that we have to shift in our perception of China is that we're not going to go dry here. But I think we need to manage this sudden release of water from the dams that China are going to build. So we're going to move more towards information and transparency on China. We need to draw them into a certain water dialogue. And this water dialogue, I think India can play an important lead by bringing in a downright period coalition with Pakistan, which is difficult, with Bangladesh, which could be probable, but also with many of the Mekong countries <laughs> through our locust approach, and bring a certain down reflect, a right period and reflection on, on China itself. But these are difficult exercises, but these are some of the ways, I think, uh, in which we can manage our uh, river issues. And I think one last statement, and it comes from many of the discussions, I think the world is increasingly moving towards living in downright period positions. I think downright period position will be felt everywhere, in the neighborhood, within the provinces of the state, and within states.
Thank you, Uttam. Again, I think uh, much to be brought to the table. You know, it was a challenge. I can see that some of our panelists and speakers have had to leave because of other engagements. But I was very keen that we should have some time for a question and answer. So we still have a few minutes. I'm also very determined that Ambassador Sajan Har should get his full 10 minutes to be able to make his concluding <laughs> remarks because so much has been said today. <laughs> but we have a few minutes, so I thought I would recognize. I mean, what I cannot do is to give each panelist a chance to respond, you know, to all the points, but definitely to any questions <coughs> and observations. So if any of you would like to take the floor and, as I said, pick up the strands from the discussion, please identify yourself, sir. And then we will uh, take Thank you, discussion. Chair. Uh, I'm a uh, counselor political from Bangladesh High Commission. My name is Javed. Uh, in fact, like I came here only to listen. I recently arrived in this town, lovely city. Uh, uh, Secretary Singh obviously um, has uh, given me some very interesting, um, uh, it, uh, it might be a very philosophical uh, uh, matter to discuss in a forum like this, like whether a country uh, should negotiate for a treaty <laughs> for 50% of uh, the water resources where, I mean, without the treaty, if you have 90%. <laughs> uh, I'm not in, an, an, an expert of water. I'm just leaving the water thing uh, where that is. I think uh, uh, some other discussions like Ajay Deep Gupta and Professor Hajarika both have uh, uh, given uh, some information like, uh, I mean, very much pertinent to uh, India-Bangladesh sharing of international water resources. You know, Bangladesh is lower riparian to, I think, all 54 of the international rivers. All 54 of the international rivers are Bangladesh's lower riparian to India. And international treaty is not just about like sharing of resources. Treaty is much more, much more than that. I mean, as uh, both um, uh, Mr. Gupta and Professor Hazarika and and, uh, and lately. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sinha have pointed out it's a matter of predictability in use of international resources. It's a matter of bringing information. It's a matter of uh, expert level exchange of ideas, um, much more than just a sharing of resources. And another aspect that uh, came in the discussion is equitable sharing of resources, like when just more than one country or more than one community is dependent on uh, resources one single resource, then it's a matter uh, of uh, sustainable management of the resource. And you know international water resources are prone to a lot of problems, sometimes man-made, sometimes natural. So we need to have a sense of order in long-term context. So uh, Bangladesh like looks into water management vis-a-vis -vis its fellow riparian countries uh, from a perspective of sustainable water resources management a uh, predictable uh, order and obviously uh, sound management of resources. So that's why Bangladesh looks forward to, I mean, not just share the resources, but to work with all its neighbors, uh, I mean, in South Asian context. Thank you so much, Chair. Glad to welcome you. I can see that we have uh, more than what we had planned for in terms of the participation. But I just want to add that under the banner of the IIC and the SPS, the Society for Policy Studies, more than a year ago, we had the benefit of listening to your High Commissioner, where he spoke about these issues. And one of the suggestions, which was then, I think, consensually accepted, was the need to have the equivalent of a similar dialogue, a chat, on track two, which would bring together India, China, Bangladesh, Nepal, and any of the other, shall we say, stakeholders in some of these issues. But it is still a work in progress. And as I said, even in my earlier remarks, we hope that we would be able to get our Chinese uh, <laughs> colleagues at some point. I think this is a point made across the board that we need to talk to them on some of these issues. And as I said, we hope we can flag it. Uh, anybody else would like to, before I request? Uh, yes, sir. Maybe just make a, a few comments uh, on some of these issues in response to some of the things that have been raised. I just wanted to emphasise that SAWI is supporting a Track 2 dialogue that has involvement from all seven countries of the South Asia region, uh, and we are seek and that is now moving to a stronger basin focus, focusing on the, the, the major Himalayan river basins. I would point out, I guess, in terms of China has been a part of that process from the beginning, but primarily it's been a part of that process from a technical point of view from the Academy of Sciences. And similarly, on the Indian side, it has not been a senior level representation. I think we've heard some interesting and different points of view from uh, either government or ex-government officials here from the India position. One about saying it, it, 
it uh, consciously does not engage in the regional discourse, uh, as we heard from AJ, and from the ex-secretary, I guess, hearing the view that it uh, recognises that engagement and dialogue is very important, uh, but pointing out its position is on a, a bilateral approach because it's easier. Absolutely it's easier, but I think it's less effective as well when we've heard the view that you do need to understand a basin view of the resource and uh, a number of the issues that were just been talked about in terms of floods, navigation and in fact hydropower and the sharing of the benefits from that go across multiple borders and are at least basin and sometimes beyond basin issues. They're not ones that can be well solved uh, on a bilateral basis in spite of that being an easier approach. Um, the comment around SAWI being donor led I feel I do have to respond to because SAWI is donor funded but it is not donor led. It is a trust fund and the money is given to the bank to manage on behalf of the donors as we see fit. In terms of how it is led, I would say our, our desire is that it is led through our track through dialogue processes and that is a part of how it is uh, led and we are seeking <coughs> to broaden that process to encapsulate uh, more civil society voices in that process, uh, as Joy Deep was saying is important. <coughs> um, but it is also partly uh, government led because of the bank's relationship with the key governments and how we work a as an institution. So while we don't get the same perhaps formal requests for the things we do uh, around our transboundary work, we have informal requests and uh, endorsement from country governments and seek to be led through our track through dialogue processes in a reciprocal way in feeding them with the, the facts and evidence. The two things I think I'm hearing out of this, which I would say are takeaway critical things to improve transboundary cooperation. One is establishing the forums for transparent and open engagement in the dialogue and debate, and this is a part of that, as is ADD and other things, but bringing, strengthening that and bringing more players, including more countries, to the table. And the second, which has been touched on, but perhaps not emphasised enough in my view, is open and transparent access to all the information. Um, because there's, people have talked about facts. I think there are many different sets of facts that are being brought to bear on the debate. And to me, that goes, as a scientist, that you only go behind the information and facts come from data. And there is not enough open and transparent sharing of the fundamental data sets on water. And that is an important issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am, I'll recognize you and I'll come back. Please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vandakini Suri. I work with an organization called the Asia Foundation. It's an international not-for-profit based out of San Francisco in the U.S., but we actually work throughout South Asia. Um, we've been doing, our India office is actually a hub for South Asia programs, and we, transboundary water governance in South Asia is a focus for us. Um, I'd like to recognize, um, you know, colleagues, Joydeep Gupta and Uttam Kumar Sinha, who we've been working with and have had a chance to dialogue with over the last few years. Um, and actually, it's been really interesting for me to hear this discussion, um, because a lot of what has been said is something that we've been thinking about as well. Um, and the perspective that we come from on this issue is again that very much, you know, the discourse and debate on transboundary water in South Asia has been very technocratic. It's been led very much at a kind of track one level, and there is a need to bring in more civil society voices. Uh, we've begun <coughs> to make some inroads in this area uh, through a through a very much political economy approach, which is looking at bringing uh, together different <coughs> stakeholders um, in in sub basins, looking at these issues. Um, and speak just I just mentioned a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, the effort of trying to convene stakeholders from different um, countries in the region to talk about specific issues. So, for instance, we did a political economy analysis on Tista River Basin, uh, and what we realized was that very often there are these mis misconceptions at the local level in Bangladesh, but similarly in West Bengal and in Sikkim, because there's a lack of information sharing about how the river, you know, where the river originates from, what are the structures that are being built on it, what is the impact that things like climate change and other issues are going to have. And I'll just um, quickly pick up on the last point that was made about data and information sharing. Uh, you know, this is increasingly emerging as a really important and key issue in South Asia. Uh, as many of you know, Mr. Singh mentioned about how, you know, there is a lot of mistrust and misconception, which is born of the fact that there is no data and information. And as Professor Hazarika mentioned, you know, the northern rivers in, uh, in India, at least, and for most of South Asia, are considered classified. We've been trying to kind of tackle um, this issue by trying to use right to information laws in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh to access data and information on transboundary rivers. So we have an ongoing project at the moment. And it's been really interesting to see um, how in India, and, uh, in Nepal, and Bangladesh, it's actually easy to get informally uh, data about, say, sedimentation, uh, flow, hydrological structures, whereas in India, it's actually quite a bit of an issue. 
Um, so I just wanted to put that Thank out you. there and sorry for taking up. Thank you. Listen, I feel very apologetic and that I'm asking all of you to finish in quick time. But here is a suggestion. Lots of people, I think, have some very valuable observations and ideas. Both the SPS and ANA would be very happy to host your comments, meaning that none of these issues can be resolved in a two-hour session. Now, what Dhruv Singh had said about the fact that it's only a question of sharing is only one view. I think Sanjay has rightly pointed out there is a texture to a river. I mean, we often say in the Asian context, forget about India and religion, rivers are both sacred and substantive. You know, there is a certain internalization which is almost ontological. So all we are saying is that in the spirit of the dialogue, those of you who have something to sort of either add to or contest or correct, please write a maximum of 800 words. You know, we have very good editors in both ANA and SPS. And we can keep this as a water dialogue. And we get a lot of people who are tracking this. So that would be my suggestion. Sanjo has asked for a one-minute two-finger, but I'll close it at that because I'm very keen that Ambassador Sajanhar should be able to give us his concluding remarks. <coughs> yeah, Please. I'm actually quite fascinated by the fact that everybody is talking about water. You know, the IUCN and uh, my institution along with Dhaka University are partnering on a water dialogue for young sc scholars and professionals. We've done it last year. We're going to do it again this year. Last year was on the Brahmaputra. We took them to the river. Yeah. We took them on our boat clinics. This year we're taking them to Sikkim and to see the tea stuff. Because all this talk about water sharing is actually very technical. When you have 25 dams being built on the tea stuff, what water is there to share? I mean, I don't even, Bangladesh doesn't know how many dams are being built on the tea stuff. There's some, there's talk about 80 dams in, in our nature. And who is all this for? You know, the question is, who is this for? And uh, the, the last, last point I want to make here is without transparency in data, you can't say you're really democratic on sharing these things. You know, I mean, we are we are losing the balance. Point taken. Thank you. Okay, on that note, as I said, I have been told very firmly that if we don't vacate this room at the prescribed time, the timekeeper will turn into a pumpkin. Sir, you don't mind if I don't recognize you? No, it's only in the interest of time because our chair will not be able to make his remarks. We will ask you to lead the discussion at tea. If that's okay by you, I'm sure our panelists would respond. Ashok, my apologies for keeping you. No, not at all. Thank you very much, Uday. And uh, I promise that the one minute that you gave me extra <laughs> during my introductory remarks, I will try to finish in four minutes now. Uh, first of all, I think uh, this we have had a very rich discussion, we have had a very substantive discussion, and we have had a very focused and yet a very diverse discussion. So I think for that, all the people, all the commentators, all the presenters have to be complimented. Now, I would not like to uh, summarize what all that has been said, because it's not even possible to do that, and we have moved from uh, the issues in Central Asia to the issues in South Asia and beyond that even into the Mekong. I think two or three aspects that uh, come to my mind and which we could as we move forward take them on on board. Number one is the issue of transparency. I think in terms of information that is available, it was mentioned by one of the speakers uh, and I think it's been generally the view around the table that uh, we need to engage China. But I guess you need, you can engage an individual or a country or an institution to the extent that it or they are willing to be engaged. Now, I know that uh, when I used to be in uh, Kazakhstan and I used to see how, how uh, the Kazakh government used to go uh, across to China asking for information, the only information that they, would, they, would, they were able to get is that uh, Kazakhstan is a good friend and we will not do anything that will impair the, uh, which will not take care of the interests <coughs> of Kazakhstan. Beyond that, I think China was not able to, and I think what my dear and good friend Daulat Kwanishev also said this morning, is that the political relationship is excellent. So we do hope that there will be a good uh, understanding and a good agreement. But I think basically, I think to engage China, we need to ensure that China is also willing to be engaged. And that can be done whether on a bilateral level or on a multilateral level. But the, the process and the effort has to continue. <coughs> Other, I think, is information. Information is sorely lacking on these issues. 
whether it is uh, uh, you know the information that we ask for from China or on the EMEA, the impeach that Kazakhstan has been asking for, and I think also on the tarim as far as Kyrgyzstan is concerned. I think information, this is, as it was mentioned, it is classified information, it is just not available. I think first that needs to be made available, then we come to the third aspect of mistrust. Mistrust or distrust. And that again brings me back to the point of dialogue. There has to be dialogue between not only different governments, that of course at the state to state level has to continue, <laughs> but as it was mentioned that it is not only the state to state level, but really at different levels, whether it is uh, track two, uh, uh, whether it is government officials, representatives, uh, in office or out of office, that they are talking at their per in their personal capacity or the personal level, at the level of uh, schools, at the level of universities, at the levels of think tanks, at the level of academia, at the level of parliaments, because I think across the board we need to reach out. And this is something that uh, maybe if this can give an impetus. The, if I may make a point beyond that, that once this dialogue is going on, and as we have seen that at different levels, these dialogues are going on, the Asia Foundation is doing something, Sanjay said he's doing something, Uttam said they are doing something. I think it needs to be brought under some sort of an umbrella to see that they, it is moving in the same direction, that it is not really pulling that <coughs> cross purposes. So let me finish my comments here, what you mentioned, Uday. My uh, remarks to my distinguished friend from Tajikistan, I think he was barely agreeing with me. Whatever the points that I had made that uh, Tajikistan provides 80% of the volume of uh, Amudarya, but uses only 7 to 10% of it. And while it comes down, Uzbekistan is using more than 50%. So I think by and large, he was agreeing with the points that I was making. So I will not comment on that. The only other comment I'll make is, I think the important and the very useful and positive role, in my view, that uh, World Bank has played, whether it was in the case of Indus Waters or it is in the case of the Aral Sea that we have seen that trying to revive it from the what it had uh, sunk to in the 1980s and 90s, and also now what we see in the case of Casa 100. And I think uh, Dr. Bill Young has given his own uh, explanation that it is uh, not uh, donor-led, but it is the recipient uh, country-led uh, programs. So on this, uh, at this note, uh, I, I would once again underline and emphasize that it's been a rich discussion, but there is need to do more and to take it forward because uh, water is going to be the one issue that will, uh, that is going to be extremely contentious uh, between different countries and of course within countries like in India. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sajanhar, I think for that overview. You know, as we are about <coughs> to conclude and I offer the water thanks, I always felt that if anyone is able to sit through till the very end in a discussion, they have the right to be heard. Sir, I shall make an exception and please you, identify man. yourself and give us your observation, but the answer will be given by the panel at T. I represent uh, Asia News Agency in the capacity of editor for economy. Uh, the only comments uh, that I have to make is that we have talked a lot, very enriching uh, dialogue on what needs to be done at the uh, total uh, international level or regional level, but we haven't devoted much time on how to improve things within the domestic turf. The issues critical are the efficiency of water use. We have abundance of water, which is also going waste because of improper use. This was referred to by the other esteemed speaker. The water levels, groundwater levels, are depleting fast on account of uncontrolled construction and industrial activities. So what needs to be done to prevent that? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I want to flag ANA for its own contribution. I think SPS has had a very valuable partnership with them. And now we break for tea, which is at the veranda downstairs. And I think we just show short by one minute maybe, but we just made it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you. As always, a pleasure.